Hello and welcome to Wednesday Warfare, where I review NXT and AEW Dynamite back to back and try and figure out which show won for the week. As always, like what you like, don't be a dick, and in honor of the late great Road Warrior Animal, oh, what a rush. NXT begins with a women's battle royal to see who will face Io Shirai for the title at TakeOver in a week and a half. Uh, before the match, though, we see that Tegan Knox got Nancy Kerrigan to buy Candice LeRae backstage, so she is not a factor in this matchup here. As it begins, we hear the announcers say, oh, lots of new names here in this battle royal, which they totally neglect to mention at all until they're already gone. One of the big stories in this matchup here is between Rhea Ripley and Raquel Gonzalez, two of the biggest, uh, baddest ladies in this matchup here. They're each eliminating a lot of ladies until they ultimately eliminate eliminate each other at the same time. Another thread we see here is all the close calls by Casey Catanzaro, all the new and creative ways she's able to avoid elimination, at one point even standing on Caden Carter's shoulders from the barricade and the plexiglass wall back to the apron. We're down to Shotzi Blackheart and Candice LeRae as your final two here, and they're fighting on the apron to the steps, and in the end, Candice ends up kind of flipping Shotzi into, or onto the floor, I should say, off the steps to win the Battle Royal, and she will face Io for the championship, which should be a pretty good matchup here. I thought it was a pretty uh, good battle royal here, I think, except for the part where they were kind of the whole issue of like, oh, here are these new faces, which we won't tell you until they're already gone. Uh, but after that, besides that point, though, I think the stories that you saw and the threads you saw in the battle royal were pretty solid. We go backstage, see a Damian Priest interview where he says the North American Championship will slip through Johnny Gargano's fingers once again at TakeOver. And regarding his opponent for the evening, Austin Theory, he says Austin Theory is a great talent, but he's had a run of bad luck lately and it's going to keep going with their match tonight. Elsewhere, we see a backstage segment segment where a Fandango is dressed like Sherlock Holmes for some reason and he's trying to arrange this odd couple tag team match with Roderick Strong and uh, Danny Birch versus Fabian Eichner and Raul Mendoza and uh, he's trying to explain it to William Regal and then Regal has Danny Birch translate it to him and that's where the segment ends. I mean uh, Fandango is always entertaining especially when he puts on the gimmicks and stuff. Uh, even the interaction where Regal says no silly English accents this time <laughs> Fandango was pretty good stuff. Up next Tommaso Ciampa takes on Jake Atlas. Champa is back to being a psycho heel again, which I think is kind of weird because NXT is still pretty heel heavy. At the time he came back, I figured it would have been a good, there was still an opportunity for him to stay a babyface, but opportunity wasted, I guess. Uh, Jake is very aggressive here to start things off. Pretty much the entire match for that matter. He really has a lot to prove in this grudge match, but ultimately Champa kicks his hand out from under him when he's in mid cartwheel DDT. Hits the Willow's Bell, but it's not good enough for Champa. He pulls down the knee pad and hits the fairy tale ending, which is does not involve the knee at all. What a heel with a swerve by Champa there. But yeah, I actually enjoyed this match. It was a shorter match, but I like the intensity. We get a promo package for Ridge Hall and then a Gauntlet Eliminator hype package, cleverly disguised as a Corey Taylor music video. And then our next match is that odd couple pairing here. You've got Eichner and Mendoza versus Strong and Birch. The winners will face off in full teams in the future for a number one contender match for the tag titles. Uh, the match was okay. I mean, it played out like what, how would you expect from a match with four guys? Guys who are usually involved in tag teams and they're with different partners than normal. Not a lot of teamwork per se, but not a lot of dissension and mass confusion, miscommunication either. Seeing Eichner and Birch in the same ring at the same time is very confusing to me. Uh, Strong and Birch win after Birch hits a cutter on Mendoza off the top rope. And so I mean, it'll be uh, Undisputed Era versus Team CAW sometime in the future for the number one contendership. Austin Theory's interviewed backstage about Damian Priest when Johnny Gargano walks into the shot. He talks Austin up and tells him that if he can soften up Damian Priest for him, he'll return the favor down the line. We go to that match now as Theory takes on Damian Priest. It's a, it's a good match. You know, he, uh, Theory really challenges Priest here, takes him to the limit, but ultimately Damian hits a razor's edge on the apron, followed up with the reckoning to win the match. Watching this thing, I mean, it just felt like a very prototypical or stereotypical like WWE style matchup here. Like two guys who work really well in the system. And I feel, I see a lot of like Seth Rollins vibes from Austin Theory here in that kind of way where he's like, he's very talented, but I feel like the moves like, they don't mean anything in the grand scheme of things. It's just move, move, move. And, but it, it looks very flashy and very impressive. And he's very athletic and he, he's good in that way. But I mean, just watching this match, I didn't get a real vibe of like, hey, these guys are, you know, really trying to fight, you know? It just felt like they were kind of like going through the motions at times. I mean, in, in that way, it was kind of not, not a great match, but I mean, I appreciated the effort put through, and I think they put each other through a lot. You know, like the Razor's Edge bump on the apron doesn't look like a very fun one to take. But then after the match, Gargano comes out of the shadows and Dex Priest the super kick and then mocks the bow and arrow gimmick at the end. So build up some more of that tension for the match at TakeOver, but we're not done seeing these guys yet. 
We then get a very interesting vignette for a mysterious stranger. It's shot in kind of like green and black night vision. It's almost like it looks kind of like a video game when you're watching it here, but there's this uh, mysterious character who talks in a distorted voice talking about how he built NXT with his blood. He built something here, but now his legacy is being replaced with these paper champions. He wants to take back what's his. He's in this room where you see this glass case with like the older versions of the NXT championship where he breaks the case and takes one of them out. And then at the very end, we see the date for TakeOver at the end. So now the question is, is who is this mysterious stranger who's presumably showing up at TakeOver? I read somewhere the only former NXT champions who are still signed and not doing anything right now are Bo Dallas and Bobby Roode. I feel like either or both of them, if it's if it, it turns out to be either of them, I think they'd be good to go back to NXT. Like they'd feel fresh and useful, especially Bo Dallas, as opposed to how he's been treated on the main roster since he's been there. So, you know, if it's either of them, you know, we'll see what happens. But um, as far as like the, the predictions, who you got? Let me know in the comments section. We get a promo package from Swerve Scott where he calls out the Cruiserweight Champion Santos Escobar, challenges him to a title match down the line, and tells him to come alone and not bring the guys from Legado del Fantasma with him. Our next match is Ridge Holland versus Antonio DeLuca. Uh, it's a little squash match, not much to say about it here. Holland throwing his smaller opponent hither and yon, lots of big old headbutts in the corner, finally ending with his finisher called Northern Grit to win. It's a very good look for Ridge Holland, and I'm looking forward to seeing what more they can do with him on NXT. Io Shirai's in interview backstage does not get too far before the Garganos interrupt and corner her. In comes Damian Priest who decks Johnny. I smell a mixed tag match for next week. Our main event is the Gauntlet Eliminator. Five guys competing to see who will face Finn Balor for the NXT Championship at TakeOver. Say, who asked for monthly TakeOvers anyway, especially nowadays? I mean, is it really necessary to have them so frequently now when it feels like they barely have time to establish number one contenders? Like, we have like less than two weeks to go before this TakeOver show. TakeOvers you used to be a big deal. They were like quarterly. They coincided with the big four. And I know that the, the model is different now and things are just weird and different. But I mean, you could still like space out the takeovers and make them mean more. When you have them more like that, I mean, it's just how different is NXT now from like Raw and SmackDown on that? But you have a smaller talent pool to work with. Anyway, the match is basically Elimination Chamber rules without the chamber itself. It starts out with Kyle O'Reilly and Kushida. Lots of grappling to start things off. But four minutes later, out comes Bronson Reed. I love that one point he does like a corner avalanche, but before he does it, he just yells out, Colossal! Can you, how weird would it be if like every wrestler just yelled out their nickname before they did a signature move? Stone Cold! Wham! Stunner! But Velveteen Dream shows up and attacks Kushida when the referee's not looking. Bronson capitalizes and eliminates Kushida. Out comes T-Thatch, and then finally Cameron Grimes. Reed is a strong boy, and he flies too. Uh, Kyle takes out Reed, then he eliminates Thatcher with a roll-up a few minutes later. It's down to Cameron Grimes and Kyle O'Reilly. Grimes thinks he's won, but Kyle gets his foot on the ropes after the first cave-in attempt. In the end, O'Reilly wins with a submission, so he will face Finn Balor for the championship at TakeOver, which should be a really good match. And just seeing this, I know, it's like, I know it's super early to predict, but I wonder if this will be the start of some kind of dissension or breakup for the Undisputed Era. You know, Adam Cole gets jealous. It's very similar to the Evolution breakup as well. You know, maybe they could recreate their PWG feud. You know, why not? Enough years have passed, and with all these years of history between them, it could could happen. Before I begin with Dynamite, I just want to say I have not yet watched the Late Night Dynamite special that aired on Tuesday night after the basketball game, although I have heard great things about the Ben Carter-Scorpio Sky match and the Brandy Rhodes and a Jay match, so I hope to look for those matches very soon. But Wednesday Dynamite opens up with a tag team match as Joey Janela and Sonny Kiss take on Kip Sabian and the in-ring debut of Miro. They do tease some action at the very beginning where they have him tag in, then right back out. That doesn't last very long, though. Miro is pretty much involved after the match. On the outside, at one point, Miro launches like Sabian into Janelle, like a double team thing, but then Joey cuts Sabian off. It's kind of a spill, like almost landing on his head on the outside. That looked kind of scary. Uh, Miro, in the end, hits the Machka kick and then the accolade on Sunny Kiss. They don't call it the Machka kick, but they do call it the accolade, which I thought was very interesting. But yeah, Sunny taps out, and uh, yeah, so Miro and Sabian win here. I thought that this match was fine, but I think it should have been shorter. I think the story here is like Miro's in ring debut. And yeah, like, I don't want to totally destroy, like, Sunny Kiss and Joey Janela, maybe sacrifice a lesser team uh, in favor of them. But I think that, yeah, I mean, the story here is Miro's in ring debut, and I think they should have capitalized on that a lot more than they did here. Then after the match, Eddie Kingston shows up to cut a promo. So that six man tag match that was advertised last week, that got totally blown up this morning when Lance Archer announced on his social media that he's been diagnosed with COVID 19. I certainly 
hope he gets better and recovers from that. Uh, I'll talk more about that situation at the end of this review, though. But anyway, so yeah, as a replacement, it was announced last minute, it's going to be Moxley defending the title against Eddie Kingston. So Kingston's here basically to provide some exposition for that match happening. So he says, he reiterates, he was never eliminated from the Battle Royal at Double or Nothing, and he's been wrestling for 18 years, so he deserves this title match. He calls Moxley a sellout and a sports entertainer, and he calls out Moxley, who does show up, but they get nose to nose before the officials break everything up. So I thought it was a nice way to set that match up like on television and not just social media. Again, super last minute adjustment here, and I think they, they did the best they could with it. Hangman Page takes on Evil Uno in his singles debut for AEW, which to me sounds crazy. He's been with AEW since last year's Double or Nothing, and only now he's wrestling a singles match. That's wild. So Kenny Omega is once again doing commentary for this match. A few minutes in, Uno tells the other Dark Order goons to skedaddle. It's a good competitive match. Page wins the Buckshot Lariat. Omega doesn't heal on Page quite as much on commentary as he did last week, though. A funny segment from earlier in the day where Tony Schiavone is interviewing Matt Jackson, and uh, Matt says you know, he feels really bad. He and Nick feel really bad about kicking Alex Marvez and referee Mike Poser. But just imagine, think of all the things that the Bucks have been through lately. Think about them. And so Tony asks some questions about FTR and it really cheeses off Matt. So he grabs Tony's phone and just bashes it against the wall and breaks it. And he goes to, gives him a, a, a wad of cash to like help him pay for it. He's like, let me put it in your pocket. Oh, it's not a real pocket. And Tony's like, no, no, it's not a real pocket. <laughs> and just like Tony playing off Matt was so funny to me. And then Matt just like throws the bills in the air. And it's like, sorry about your phone. So yeah, that was a pretty funny segment. TNT Championship match up next as Brody Lee defends against Orange Cassidy. As the match begins, Orange puts his sunglasses on Anna Jay. And for a split second, I had hoped that was going to break the Dark Order spell on her. Like it was magical sunglasses. Uh, it's a very one-sided affair for the most part here. Orange tries to get his little uh, kicks in, but Brody has no time for that shit. Uh, Orange goes for like a pockets dive, but the Dark Order catch him, and Brody dives into all of them, which is really fun to see. Yeah, Lee spends several minutes just beating the bejesus out of Orange, but Cassidy makes a big valiant comeback. In the end, though, uh, Brody wins with the discus lariat after a hard-fought battle. And then, after the match, the lights cut out, that famous ethereal music plays, and it's Cody. Cody is back. He looks like a proper vampire now with his black hair and his pocket watch on his jacket. He single-handedly takes out the Dark Order goons as Brody Lee runs off. I feel like JR really understood sold like the gravity of the situation of Cody coming back after five weeks after he was just beaten so badly by Brody Lee for the TNT championship. I think that like Tony and Excalibur had to kind of pick up the slack for him. After the match though, and after the whole thing, we see Brody Lee cutting a promo backstage, a big shouty promo is one of probably the better, one of the better promos of the evening on a night which a lot of weak promos, honestly, but Brody's was probably one of the top ones for me. And he conveniently has a dog collar like around him. Like he gets like John Silver to give him the dog collar. He's apparently had this whole time. So he calls out Cody for a dog collar match. He says he will cut Cody down. He gives him one week to make his decision. I'm excited for that matchup. I think dog collar matches can be like pretty brutal to watch. And so like these guys, I think can be able to deliver that. But yeah, I think it was, you know, exciting to see Cody back, even if JR kind of undersold a little bit. Matt Hardy and Private Party make their way to the ring. And Matt tries to recount the events of last week when a mystery assailant attacked him from behind, hitting him in the leg. He basically calls shenanigans on Chris Jericho and Jake Hager, saying that they did it. Out come the inner circle and Jericho on the stage announces the return of Sammy Guevara and he's back. Yay, that felt kind of an underwhelming waste of a return like because he did nothing for the rest of the segment so like, why they even bother bringing him back when he didn't do anything? Jericho denies attacking Hardy last week then Mark Quinn wants to challenge him then Isaiah Cassidy steps up and challenges Jericho to a match for next week and he says, you know, people are counting me out already but what if I were to beat Jericho next week and make him my Le Champion bitch? Like, hmm, that insult means a bit of retooling a bit of workshopping but your heart's in the right place. Uh, you know, Jericho does accept the match later on, so that match will be happening. Should be interesting. Poor Tony Schiavone's in the ring with FTR and Tully Blanchard. Tully says he wants to establish a new 20-minute time limit for title matches as opposed to 60 minutes called the 20-minute brush with greatness. And the way I just described all that to you was far snappier and less clunky than what they actually did in the ring to the big long walk to get to that point. I feel like it took a long time. So they're talking about what teams they want to face for these 20-minute brush with greatness greatness. Out come the best friends who want to shot at the belts, but FTR balk and they say, you, know, you guys aren't 100% yet, so we'll just kind of put a pin in it. And Chucky e. T calls them weenies, and they, they give the people what they want, and that's how the segment ends. Man, this, this segment, in my opinion, kind of dragged the show to a halt, because that awkward exchange
exchange with Tully and Tony and FTR kind of chiming in too. This was hard to get through even at 1.5 speed, which is how I was watching it. It picked up near the end when the best friends got involved, but this segment could have been done probably backstage or something. The AEW Women's Champion, Ikaru Shida, and the NWA Women's Champion, Thunder Rosa, unite in the ring for the first time to take on Ivelisse and Diamante. A cool Road Warrior animal-inspired face paint on Thunder Rosa's face for this match here. The match was okay, but just okay. I didn't really have any strong feelings about this matchup here. Shida wins for her team with the big knee to Diamante's face. Then after that, Chris Jericho is interviewed backstage where he does accept Isaiah Cassidy's challenge, says he'll beat him next week. In walks MJF, and the two exchange pleasantries and compliments, and then finally they both simultaneously say, so why'd you call me a loser? Referring to their bit in the parking lot a couple of weeks ago. So that whole segment inspired this segment where they're doing the same kind of setup here, and then they ultimately kind of walk back with their saying, say, oh no, I was MJF says, I was referring to the limo drivers as losers. And Jericho goes, I was referring to Tony Schiavone as a loser. And then they kind of bond over that, and then they go their separate ways again. I was kind of expecting another split screen to keep that going, but not this time. So anyway, I think this was okay. Not as good as the segment that inspired this conversation, but these two always work well together. As I mentioned earlier, the six-man tag team match of John Moxley, Will Hobbs, and Darby Allen versus Lance Archer, Brian Cage, and Ricky Starks was canceled after Archer tested positive for COVID, which brings about this replacement match, Moxley versus Kingston AEW Championship. A uh, tough break for Will Hobbs, by the way, because of all the six guys, I was really excited to see him kind of rub elbows with the champion here in this match. That will hopefully happen down the line, but just not in this night. Uh, the match starts out very slow and deliberate, but it quickly turns into a fight outside of the ring. It's a very physical back and forth matchup here. I really enjoyed the work these two had here. In the end, Kingston goes for the spinning back fist, but Moxley ducks it, hits the rear naked choke into the bulldog choke, uh, which is how he beat Brody Lee a few weeks ago. So the referee stops the match, Moxley wins, and then right afterward, though, the Lucha Brothers attack Moxley. In, come Will, in comes Will Hobbs to make the save, but he's taken out. Darby Allen shows up, and then Ricky Starr takes him out, so the heels are just beating down the baby faces, standing tall as the show comes to a close. I think, you know, again, for a match, for a main event that was blown up and then was, you know, everything was changed last minute, day of, they did the best with what they could. But what I'm really nervous about is the fact that it sounds like there was more than meets the eye when it comes to these COVID cases. Lance Archer is just the beginning, from what I can tell. I'm really nervous about how things are going to develop because there are some other talent that's like not, that weren't seen the last taping or something and so I'm really hoping that nothing really blows up beyond that but I, I gotta you know I'm kind of like hoping for the best expecting the worst with this hopefully everyone's okay but I feel Lance Archer unfortunately is just the beginning Time now for me to decide which show won for the week. NXT or AEW Dynamite, and this week my choice is NXT. I think from beginning to end, it was a stronger show. The only thing I didn't like about NXT was that odd couple tag team match. Like, the chemistry not being there is kind of expected for that kind of story, but it's felt kind of thrown together for me. Meanwhile, I feel like AEW kind of missed the mark tonight. Like, for a show that's normally so just on point, it hits a lot of home runs when it comes to promos, with a, with a, a couple of notable exceptions, a lot of sleepy promos on this night. Night that I just didn't like care for. Everything just felt like it was kind of off and derailed. And I don't know how much the, the booking change of the main event had to play into it, but it just felt like it was kind of an off evening for me. I felt the action on NXT was better this week, which is why it gets the point. But let me know what you thought about NXT and AEW this week in the comments section below. Little heads up, in case you missed my social media posts about it last week, I am planning on doing a fan mail opening video in the next couple of weeks. So if you want to mail some stuff to me, be they letters or memorabilia, wrestling or otherwise, you just want me to open on camera, send that stuff to Brian Zane at 316 California Avenue, number 53, Reno, Nevada, 89509. That's not my personal address, don't worry. I'm not giving up my actual proper home address. This is my mailing, my P.O. box address. You can send that stuff to me. And the next couple weeks, I plan to do an opening for all the stuff. I've gotten a couple pieces so far. I look forward to getting a few more, at least a few more, hopefully, as the next week or so goes on before I open the stuff. So yeah, if you want to have your stuff shown on, on camera here for a video, send it my way. Until then, folks, I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.